talk rather than just telling you about a project I've done. Uh, and that uh, grew out of listening to all of the papers since yesterday morning uh, and the different ideas being discussed here about everything from diving physiology and modeling of, uh, of what actually happens in decompression sickness to techniques for improving safety on site to uh, organization of diving projects like uh, Mikhail was talking about. Um, I've learned a lot of new terms that I didn't know about before. Um, to be honest, I, I hadn't come into contact with this idea of DIR, or D-I-R, um, diving, uh, although what I'm going to describe to you today is probably going to sound to most of you a lot like something like that. Um, and I've also uh, been made aware now of some of the things that we've been doing in archaeological diving uh, make a lot of sense in terms of the kinds of modeling that Bruce and uh, Alpha talked about, and some of the other things we've been doing, in fact, seem, seem actually to be counterproductive. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't work, <laughs> it, but it just means that they don't, they don't necessarily make sense anymore. And I wanted to go through with you archaeological diving uh, of a particularly kind, uh, and since we've mostly all, all, week, uh, all weekend been uh, looking at projects taking place in Northern Europe, uh, where uh, you know, a nice tropical dive has eight degree water temperature and uh, that sort of thing. That uh, and we made jokes about the, the, the warm gin clear waters of Sweden. Um, I thought I'd actually take you on a project that happens in clear water visibility of about 60 meters, water temperature never lower than 16. Just so you know, it's possible. Uh, and that in fact, uh, you can still do something that approaches technical diving without freezing your ass off. And that has to do with this project that I directed in Turkey from 1995 to 1998 at a place called Bozbrun, which means Grey Cape. It's on the southwest corner of uh, Turkey. This was one in a series of projects that have been going on in Turkey since 1960. Um, and in fact, the diving practice I'm going to tell you about developed steadily from that first project in 1960. Um, the idea of using free swimming divers to do underwater archaeology um, began even earlier than that. And the first project that most people point to where that was attempted was in 1955 uh, with Cousteau at a place called Grand Comblouet in France. Uh, although most places that talk about underwater archaeology being accomplished at a truly archaeological level um, refer to this project, Cape Caledonia on the south coast of Turkey, led by a graduate student from the University of Pennsylvania, George Bass, the guy on the right, um, and a journalist uh, named Peter Throckmorton, the guy on the left. And they operated with what was high-tech equipment for their day. Um, they were working off of a sponge uh, fishing boat. The, boat. the wreck had been found by sponge fishermen using hard hat suits. Uh, and they used uh, scuba uh, of a very early uh, type, single hose, single stage, or double hose, single stage regulators. No buoyancy compensating devices at all. Uh, George Bass, when he was, is still diving, he's 74 years old now, uh, he still won't wear a BC. He, he believes it's an automatic death machine and the most dangerous piece of equipment ever invented. <laughs> See, every single one of them is an embolism waiting to happen, is what he said. He said, get your weight right, you'll be fine. Um, through the course of the 1960s, since that first project began uh, and continued on, um, part of the the development of the field of underwater archaeology was in, was in the development of archaeological technique. And that was trying to find a way to excavate and document a site underwater as efficiently and accurately as it could be done on land. Um, the underwater environment, as we all know, produces certain challenges that you don't find on land. Um, partly that's com one of those is comfort. Another one is uh, attention span. I don't care how experienced a diver you are, there is always a part of your brain that is going Where's that next breath coming from? And there's a part of your brain that ought to be doing that. And that part of your brain can't be used to do archaeology. Um, movement is, is harder, although paradoxically, moving sediment, moving dirt underwater, is actually a whole lot easier than it is on that. Ex actually, excavating is easier. And you can get a bird's eye view of the site just by floating, assuming you're working in clear water. At the same time that these archaeological techniques were being developed, it was necessary to develop a particular set, a code of practice for archaeological diving. Um, archaeological diving is not like sport diving, although most archaeological divers in the world are primarily trained as sport divers. They're not trained as commercial or scientific divers. 
although scientific diving training is starting to take over. Uh, and for the most part, it's not something that this meeting would recognize as technical diving. Uh, although I've been trying to get someone to define for me when is it technical diving and when is it not. Um, and uh, after talking for several, with several people, three characteristics I seem to be hearing a lot are um, breathing something other than regular air, uh, diving beyond de no decompression limits in terms of depth or duration of dive, uh, and working in overhead environments. Uh, something else that I would say is characteristic of technical diving from everything I've heard at this meeting is that it involves an extremely structured approach to the planning and execution of dives, uh, much more so than uh, other kinds of diving. Um, and so in a lot of those regards, archaeological diving is a kind of technical diving. We do not typically work in overhead environments. Um, we do not typically breathe gases other than air, except recently nitrox has come into use on some sites. We do not typically dive um, very deep. Um, most archaeological projects take place in less than 40 meters of water. There's a very good reason for that. Well, there's two very good reasons for that. One of those is duration of time on site. Excavating a shipwreck underwater is the most inefficient way you can learn about the past. You get to work for half an hour at a time, maybe twice a day. Uh, it's not as efficient as doing archaeology on land. <coughs> Um, but it works out that it's still worth doing. Um, the other uh, thing is that most shipwrecks are in less than 40 meters of water. I don't care what Bob Ballard says in his specials about all the wonderful wrecks to be found in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. If you look at statistical analysis of all ship losses in the historic period when we have good records, since 1800, 90% of all ship losses are within sight of the coast. Most ships are lost because they run into the land. As a friend of mine said, the secret of success in being a ship captain consists of doing three things. Keep the ship in the water. Keep the water out of the ship. Keep the people in the ship. <laughs> if you can do those three things, you'll probably be all right. Um, just like pilots say, the secret in flying an airplane is to stay in the middle of the air. Stay away from the edge of the air because there are hard things like buildings and rocks there. It's the same thing with ships. Most ships wreck in diveable water. There are some spectacular wrecks out there in two miles of water or 200 meters of water, but most of the material we're likely to encounter as archaeologists is in less water than that. Over the years, uh, they developed in this, the course of this some more sophisticated equipment. Uh, as diving itself, uh, scuba diving itself developed and introduced new technology, um, some double stage regulators, uh, better masks. Actually, that's one of the biggest improvements from an archaeological perspective is better masks. Although it's surprising how many archaeologists still prefer a big single pane job because of the binocular vision you get. And a lot of people like to wear glasses under the mask. It also developed uh, have, trying to find the right balance in efficiency. And that, the key issue there is bottom time versus mobility. It's that efficiency issue of how much time you can spend on the bottom. And so one of the things that developed early on in the practice of the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, my former employer, and the people who started doing this in 1960 in Turkey, was realizing that normal sport diving tables are not efficient enough to get something done underwater, especially if you're beyond 20 meters in depth. And so very early on, archaeological diving in this environment was decompression diving. And that was going and finding the right balance of bottom time versus decompression time. And generally coming to an understanding that as long as your decompression time did not exceed your dive time, you could still accomplish things without wearing people out. Because one of the things that's characteristic of this kind of diving is we don't organize a project and then go diving for two days. We're talking about diving twice a day, six days a week, for 12 to 15 weeks, which can be a massive nitrogen load if you don't approach it in a scientific manner, if you don't get careful about it, but you still want to accomplish something. And a lot of this development really came to fruition in uh, what was the Institute's biggest project the second longest underwater excavation in history after the Cronin Project, which has been going on continuously for 25 years, was at Ulubrun, which means Great Cape or Big Nose in Turkish. This is the Big Nose right behind me, which was a project that had 11 continuous seasons of excavation. 
It was on a site on a 45 degree slope of a ship that sank about 3,300 years ago. A Bronze Age wreck carrying as its primary cargo uh, metal ingots, uh, about 30, <coughs> 22 tons of copper and 10 ingots. Basically enough metal to equip an army of 10 to 15,000 men. Uh, it's a strategic loss equivalent to the United States losing two aircraft carrier groups today in terms of how much military material is represented by this one wreck. All the, all the components of the wreck are high status goods. It's clearly a royal shipment from one king to another somewhere. It's on a uh, karst topography. It's this limestone uh, shelving cliff that runs down into the water. You can see a uh, topographic map here in this slide. The upper end of the site is at 45 meters. The bottom end of the site is somewhere beyond 65 meters. And so the challenge was to come up with a diving protocol that would make it possible to excavate this site in its remote location within the infrastructure provided by the Turkish economy of the 1980s and still do it safely enough that it wasn't risking anyone's life, nothing down there worth, in, worth risking anyone's life for, and still make it efficient enough to make it worthwhile. Some of the material they were looking at, as I said before, is high status goods. You have a big gold cup, I think it weighs a kilogram and a half, um, and it's of no archaeological value whatsoever. We have no idea where it was made, when it was made, and because it's gold, there's almost no chemical analysis you can do on it that'll tell you anything about it. So where is it now? It's, uh, it's, in, the, it's in the safe uh, of the Bodrum Museum of Underwater Archaeology, and if you're a VIP guest, like you're the Prime Minister of Turkey and his guest, you'll get to drink wine out of it. So uh, on the left, you have a chunk of elephant tusk. There were also uh, lots of ivory uh, from uh, hippopotamus. Mm -hmm. Most of the ivory in the ancient world comes from hippopotamus, not, not, not elephant. Ebony logs, terebinth resin, all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, in fact, this, the coolest artifacts are these three, from my point of view. Um, I was there when they found the gold scarab and the little book. This is the world's oldest book. It's actually had wax embedded in those two tablets, and you would have written in it. Unfortunately, the wax didn't survive, because it almost certainly said, Dear King Shubaluliumas, this please accept this shipment of 265 gold ingots. Good no luck. Um, a little uh, duck-shaped cosmetics box, probably made in Egypt. And on the right, the most historically significant object from the wreck. This is a gold scarab, which is about as big as your thumbnail. Solid. Uh, and what it says on it, do I have a laser pointer on this by any chance? Oh, God. <laughs> these three symbols here, no, these three symbols here say Nefer, Nefer, Nefer. This is a scarab of Queen Nefertiti of Egypt. It had to have belonged to her personally or have been given by her personally to one of her representatives at some time. And based on the way that these uh, hawks are facing, it also means Queen Nefertiti, ruler of Egypt. The only piece of historical evidence that suggests that she ruled Egypt after her husband Akhenaten died. This was probably looted from her tomb and by this point, because she died about 50 years earlier, and the tombs of the Paradic Pharaoh had been destroyed shortly after his death. So how do you excavate this? It's in 42 to 65 plus meters. Um, they did a bounce dive down to 65 and could see that there was still material trailing down the slope, and the excavation director just decided, well, that's nice. We're not going there. It's just not worth it. Typical profiles were uh, a 20 minute dive in the morning and a 16 minute dive in the afternoon with a five hour surface interval in between, with decompression stops at 12, 9, and 6 meters on air. They looked at mixed gas, heliox trimix. And the problem was that there was no way to support that kind of diving reliably within the Turkish economy at the time on a remote site where everything had to be brought in by boat. Now, if I were doing this today, I wouldn't even consider doing that project that way with novice student divers. It's foolish. But the idea was that not to was to create so structured an environment and a safe, the safest possible working environment in the same place that you could establish a safety net and a code of practice that had to be adhered to rigidly by all participants that made it possible to do that kind of work. 
In this case, they made over 22,000 dyes in 11 seasons. Those first seven seasons were uh, all the decompression was on air, although in the last four seasons, they went shifted to pure oxygen at six meters. How did that work out? Seven confirmed cases of decompression sickness, one of those with permanent damage, which is uh, some mild sensory nerve damage in one leg, although no mobility impairment. Interestingly, that occurred to the oldest diver on the project, who was also the dive physician. <laughs> there were seven probable cases of DCS that could not be confirmed one way or the other. Um, all 14 cases occurred with the diver within the tables. No one violated the tables. All the confirmed cases occurred before they started using in-water oxygen decompression. And the thing they found most interesting was that nearly all cases occurred on a diver's first day back in the water, on the day after the day off, or after being ill. And almost all had some component of dehydration involved. Typically on that day off, somebody had gone mountain climbing, or something like that. Because you're working in a hot environment to begin with, Ambient temperature on the rock face where the, tent, where the site was located was about 40 degrees. Um, and then people would go off into the hills on the day off, something like that. Or they would, uh, there was also a policy of keeping alcohol consumption low. You, had, you were allowed one drink in the evening before a diving day, which meant that Thursday night, right before the day off, was always party night. You could get blitzed then if that's what you wanted to do. There were some people who occasionally got so blitzed on Thursday night they were still dehydrated on Saturday morning. So a large number, a large proportion of these cases occurred on the first or second dive on Saturdays, first day back. <coughs> but generally speaking, that's not a bad safety record. Um, and in fact, in the entire history of INA's diving in Turkey from 1960, they've only had two cases of decompression sickness that resulted in any permanent damage. And that, would, that amounts to something like 60,000 dives over 45 years. Now, we all had, we had this in mind when we began the Bose Bruin project in 1995. We had all of that experience that had been accumulated uh, at Blue Bruin to, be, to work with. And so the site here is a much simpler site to deal with. Um, it's on a much easier slope, about 25 degrees, and a much shallower depth. The upper end of the site is at 27 meters. The lower end of the site is about 35 meters. So that's much much nearer the safety zone for normal um, intelligent person diving. It's located on the southwest corner of Turkey. If you've ever been there, then you might have heard of Marmaris, which is a very popular uh, summer resort town, primarily for Germans and Scandinavians. Um, the English go to Bodrum up here on the coast. Um, the wreck is located on the, against the face of a cliff here in this extremely rugged piece of coastline. And in fact, the local village, Selimia, has only been accessible by road since 1994. The, the 4,000 years before that, you had to get there by walking or uh, take a boat. Here's the cliff. And uh, the wreck was located on this spur. Essentially, the ship hit this spur and went to the bottom. Um, it's located 30 meters down and 5 meters offshore. because It's a vertical cliff face. Uh, and then the excavation camp was set up up here. Um, it's a big pile of amphoras, clay jars that were carrying wine. Uh, and so the excavation task here involved movement of sediment and recovering all these objects, um, as well as recovering the hull of the ship, which is underneath this pile of uh, clay jars. It was possible to date the wreck to, uh, the ship was built in AD 874, based on dendrochronology, that is tree ring analysis, it was possible to say that. And also the, the wood was cut probably somewhere not so far from modern-day Istanbul. It wasn't a big ship. It was about 15 meters long originally. Uh, and the cargo was red wine carried in 1,200 to maybe 1,500 clay jars, uh, each one of which was about this big. Not a very big cargo. We'll get to, back to that in a moment. Uh, you can see this is partway through the excavation, and the lower layer of these jars are still stacked in orderly rows to where the stevedores had placed them 1,200 years ago, almost 1,200 years ago. And just like Mikhail was describing, there's a whole lot of logistical work that goes into preparation to actually do the project. You have to have some place to live, eat, 
take a crap. Um, so that you can concentrate on doing the archaeology in the most comfortable possible environment. One of my predecessors at the Institute believed that the best way to get the best performance out of an archaeologist was to mistreat him, to put him in the most brutal environment with the most deprivation you could come up with, a very Lutheran way of thinking, I think, um, that, uh, and that suffering is good for the soul mentality. Um, we disagreed and thought that uh, a comfortable, healthy, well-rested, and well-fed diver and archaeologist is a more effective, safer diver and archaeologist. So the beginning of each season involved building a little village to live in. Uh, you can see one of our typical half huts here, um, which is really just a roof to keep the sun off. It doesn't rain any time during the summer. Well, it always rains one day during the season, uh, typically in June. So everybody keeps a piece of plastic tarp to put over their stuff. And a big communal area for eating, that sort of thing. And one of the cheapest ways you can assure healthy, safe, effective, happy divers is hire a cook. Hire a professional cook and give them all the money they need to buy good food. Suffering through bad food is one way to destroy the morale of a project when you've got 30 people working on it. We also installed our own sanitation facilities. This is digging the septic pit for the toilet block. Um, you can't ask archaeologists to dig a septic pit because they have to stop for every box shirt, every bone crack, <laughs> and discuss it. <laughs> However, it is when you're when they're done a perfectly straight-sided flat bottom. <laughs> and this is what the camp looked like when we were done. Um, this you can't see. This is actually a baseball field out here. We uh, we had extra time one season when our excavation permit was delayed, so we made some improvements. Uh, this is the altar of Zeus on which we made burnt offerings. The barbecue pit big enough to roast a whole pig, um, and uh, there's a local hunter that would shoot wild boar in the hills because they were tearing up the, the wheat terraces. And the Turks don't eat that stuff, but the, those crazy Americans like to barbecue them. So he'd come down and sell them to us for a couple dollars a pound. Um, and so we built a baseball diamond out here to, to keep fit. The dive platform, uh, previous vessels had worked off, uh, excavations had worked off of vessels, but uh, we were close enough to shore it was easy, easier to dive off the shore which involved bashing uh, a level spot in, this, in the side of the cliff and, oops, and adding uh, about, I think we hand mixed about 40 tons of concrete to put in platforms here to support the excavation. We needed to run, be able to run compressors out there to power airlifts, uh, so we had a, a 45 kilowatt diesel generator we parked out there. That was, that was a fun project, to get the diesel ashore. And then uh, a platform down by the water, gear lockers, that sort of thing. Um, so that you could get in and out of the water easily, uh, minimize the amount of time it would take you to get to the site, boat moorings, that sort of thing. And this was the diving practice that we did on. At these depths, we dived on air for the first uh, three seasons, um, although we had discussed from the very beginning of the project that we, we thought it would be more efficient in this depth to dive on nitrox. Um, and we started negotiations for a nitrox system. Um, the board of directors of our institute weren't willing to fund it for the first two years. We always dived on air. We dived air at Ulubarun. Yeah. And we got 14 people bent. What's, what's your evidence? Um, and so, but we finally got approval for the last two seasons uh, and had an arrangement with a company that made a system, unfortunately they were involved in a patent litigation for one season, so we, we didn't actually get nitrox for the last season. <clears throat> our, our schedule here was two dives a day, six days a week, 12 to 15 weeks. Bottom time varied, depending on the individual, uh, from 25 to 40 minutes, uh, as well as the depth. Uh, you couldn't do a 40 minute dive beyond 33 meters, you had to stick to a 35 minute dive on, that tra on the decompression trade-off. You had to have a service interval of five hours. The decompression was, for most dives, a single stop at six meters on surface supplied oxygen. The tables we were using for this were custom designed by the Diving Physiology Research Center at Duke University, a fellow named Lindley Van, who uh, worked with us on this, because he'd been involved in the introduction of oxygen, in water oxygen decompression for the Ulubrun project. And so these tables had to be validated every entry on the table had to have 72 successful dives made before you could go up to the next entry on the table. 
Uh, so for example, we had to start the first season with doing 25 minute dives at each depth until we had 72 incident free uh, dives. Then the next, then you could do, go to 30 minutes, 72 dives, 35 minutes, and worked our way up to 40. Um, until we had one incident occur um, on somebody doing the 40 minute table at 33 meters, we had to back off one step until we could establish what had happened to that guy. I'll get to that. The nitrox we were using, um, here was part of the problem in working in Turkey, um, and that is the uh, access to gases. Getting oxygen is not a problem. Uh, it, there was an oxygen plant relatively close to the excavation that produced very high grade oxygen. Um, but the, we did not want to be involved in the business of mixing gas out in the field, because you need to have people who really know what they're doing then. Um, and I wasn't willing to, uh, to entrust this to a couple of students. We did find a system that, was a, that produces denitrogenated air, essentially uses a heated microfiber filter um, that was originally designed for producing nitrogen by filtering it out of the air. We simply hook the filter up. This system hooks the filter up backwards and you use the waste product, which is air with less nitrogen in it. So rather than enriched oxygen, enriched air nitrox, it's denitrogenated air nitrox. This involves no mixing of gases. You pump in low pressure compressed air on one side, you get low pressure compressed nitrox out the other side, which then runs straight into your high pressure compressor for filling bottles. Um, because our high pressure compressor was a very high capacity one, uh, it would fill two, two sets of twin 10 meter tanks in seven minutes simultaneously. It was a US Air Force surplus compressor used for charging bottles on F-86 fighters. It was also 40 years, 35 years old, um, but still in excellent condition until the very last season. I can tell you I can change the exhaust valves in that compressor in 12 minutes. How do I know this? Um, and then, but this meant we actually had to hook up three low pressure compressors in parallel to provide enough gas through it. This also has the advantage that you can dial in the specific nitrox mixture you want, in which case we settled on uh, actually nitrox 31 was the mixture we were using. Um, mostly to provide a safety level because, so that we can keep the partial pressure of oxygen within a safe range at the bottom end of the site. Because a lot of the work we were doing was heavy work on the, underwater, pounding things into rocks, that sort of thing, which increases your susceptibility to oxygen toxicity. We did not want to run into that problem. We also made sure that we put a fence up at the bottom end of the site so you couldn't go down the slope beyond the safe depth limit. Well, you, you could, but it, it would provide a barrier. We also uh, hit, have followed the INA practice, and that is to establish a safe diving environment, a very structured diving environment. Um, when you're off diving on your own, you can dive any way you want, but if you're diving on my project, you will dive the way I say you dive. And everybody will dive the same way, so that everybody knows what's going on, and everybody's equipment will be compatible so that you can actually help your buddy if your buddy gets into trouble. In addition, the environment on the surface can accommodate any problem we might have. We were too far away from any established decompression chamber, and so since the late 1960s, we've always operated our own chambers. And so we established a four-man double lock decompression chamber on site uh, with its own generator uh, and its own com dedicated compressor to operate it so that it could always be used. And every single person on the project had to learn how to fill it. So if the dive doc or the hyperbaric technician was the one who got hit, you could at least get him and everybody could get him into treatment. And we had regular chamber drills, and everybody who was on the project had to go through a short chamber dive at the beginning of the season so they knew what it was like if they had to be the tender. And fortunately, because we had the double lock, we could lock up. Uh, position in or out, and we always had a hyperbaric position on the project. So if somebody had to be treated, there was somebody who knew what to do there. And here you can see um, students learning how the chamber operated. Because we were doing in-water decompression, uh, we uh, established a, a hooker rig over the side uh, filled from large 60-liter oxygen bottles. These had to be changed out, and in fact, virtually all of the Injuries of any kind we had in the history of the project were mashed fingers and toes handling big oxygen bottles. So 
I, I, I've, got a, I've got scores on two of my knuckles for one of those. But then you had an observation station. Oops. The dive uh, timer sat here, and here's your surface controller. Whoever sitting at this desk is in charge. No questions asked. If he scrubs or she scrubs the dive, you get out of the water. Um, I only had a problem with that once, in which, because uh, we would go down in teams of four, and you all had to submerge on signal. There was an underwater horn to tell you when your bottom time was up. You also had a dive timer to know when your bottom time was up, but we blew a horn so you knew it was time. <coughs> we actually gave you a two minute warning and then the come up signal. Um, and we had the founder of our institute, the, the guy who thinks PCs are a, a ben, you know, an embolism waiting to happen. He didn't like being told what to do. And the person who was the dive timer that day was a student who was trying to tell a distinguished professor, no, wait, you can't go down yet, because I haven't said so. That's a tough position to put a student in. Um, but the, so there was a person timing and doing surface control the entire time. Equipment storage, ready area for people who are not diving. Uh, and then the people who are preparing for the next dive uh, have a clear area in which to get dressed. And this platform is big enough for eight people to be on simultaneously. So the dive getting in and the dive coming out can do that. The timing was generally set up so that uh, the next dive was waiting on the surface when the first dive came to the decompression stop. Once the previous dive were all on oxygen at the decompression stop, we knew that their decompression time was less than the dive time for the next dive, plus there were extra hookah regulators in case they had a problem. And so then the second dive would be sent down. Um, in fact, the decompression got, had long been an issue because uh, on, when we were diving on air, a typical decompression schedule for two 40-minute dives was 15 minutes on the morning dive and 30 minutes on the afternoon dive, which isn't any time at all for you guys who are diving in caves and down to 200 meters. Um, it's a walk in the park for you. Um, but on the other hand, you're probably not doing it twice a day every day for a whole summer. So uh, people came up with ingenious ways to occupy their time. Um, we eventually suspended a bucket here for the hooker rig, and people put books in it. A cheap paperback novel will last through three readings underwater. And that, that actually came into the dive planning issue, because there's only room for so many books. You couldn't put two people on the same dive who were reading the same book on the deep <laughs> <brain. laughs> And there are people who had a little magnetic chess board down there. And somebody figured out a way to do underwater crossword puzzles, that sort of thing. Um, and I've lost track of the number of games of rock, rock scissors, paper I've played. So. <clears throat> we also wanted to create a safe working environment on the bottom. One of the problems with archaeological diving is you ideally want to be wearing as little equipment as is physically possible that will get in your way or potentially damage the site. And I'll be honest with you, my ideal diving, diving setup would be if I, if, I, if I could dive naked with a beer in my hand. <laughs> the, the thing that I dislike about diving is having to wear all the gear. It gets in my way when I'm trying to work underwater. It's like, a lot like the caving operations, exploration diving. You're focused on the task and you want the gear to be as transparent as possible. You want it to be as unobtrusive as possible. And so we don't want our divers going in the water with stage bottles and bailout bottles. What we do instead is we mount all of that hardware at the bottom so that no diver is ever more than four meters away from a complete and separate and functional alternate air source. Every diver also has a buddy. Everybody has uh, a, lo a long hose with a second regulator on it, has a redundant system of their own. Uh, and in addition uh, to all the spare tanks mounted around the site, we have a small diving bell mounted on site that has a spare tank mounted on it and a captive air bubble. If you get in trouble, we do not want you to come to the surface in a panic. We want you to go to the bubble, get your head out of the water, get yourself sorted out there. <coughs> Big enough that two people can go in there and talk. Ideally, you and your buddy should go in there and get yourself sorted out rather than uh, having anyone come to the surface. I really hate it when panic divers come to the surface. We had it happen once with a guest diver, who was my buddy, 
and I, and, I, and I remember clawing frantically for the six meters, the last six meters, to try to keep her from blowing it out of the surface. In, this, in the course of this project, we had 8,000 dives with no confirmed or probable cases of decompression sickness. We had two incidents that resulted in chamber treatment. Uh, one of these uh, was watery vision after a dive. The doc said, well, that's possibly an optic nerve hit. I'm not taking any chances. Regular five hour, six hour chamber treatment, and it went away, and, uh, and everything was fine. But the same person had the same symptoms reoccur later in the year when she wasn't diving. And it was later determined to be a dehydration issue. The other one was uh, a middle ear imbalance that occurred at about 25 meters on ascent. I'm sure everybody knows about this. It happens. Uh, and in this particular case, the guy who was our dive doc was a research doctor who had no clinical experience and knew him. The dive doc decided before he'd even seen the patient that he was going to chamber him. Oh, he must be bent in the chamber. And after he went through the chamber treatment, he was sent to the University of Istanbul to their uh, diving physiology medical center, and they did a full workup on him and, and took down the case history. And they said, well, he had a middle ear imbalance on ascent. And then he panicked and started, started to hyperventilate but he wasn't actually that. But it was a diving incident, and we had to alter our practice a little bit to deal with that. Our strong emphasis was on keeping people not fatigued and keeping them hydrated with what we was called the P-check. It was established the last thing you ought to do before you get in your wetsuit is you ought to need to pee. I, I want to see urine going out of the toilet at the dive site before every dive. So then I know that you've got enough fluid in your system. And if you don't want to pee in your wetsuit, you're only in the water for 80 minutes. Anybody ought to be able to do that. The work itself uh, was pretty straightforward. Um, you have to move sediment and map what's down there. Um, here you can see somebody using an airlift to map in the amphoras and then lifting them. Um, this is just a regular milk crate, which we discovered will hold two amphoras with a little bit of padding very well. Uh, and then a <coughs> A bigger problem is managing all this stuff at the surface. Uh, when you bring this stuff up, it has to be handled properly. It has to be kept wet, and it has to be, um, and all those amphores have to be decanted because they're full of mud for the most part. Uh, and so this was the amphora pen. Um, mostly people thought, oh, we'll have, to, we'll have to build a big tank to keep this in. So, no, we don't. We have this big tank called the Aegean Sea right in front of the camp. We'll just build a, fence, you know, a fenced enclosure. And we're there, and nobody's going to steal this stuff. Um, this stuff had to be cleaned, it had to be documented in the field, so a large part of the operation, the largest part of the operation, is not diving. Um, and, and it took a while for some people to get a hold of that idea, um, to understand that when they came on this project, diving is something they were going to do for about two and a half hours a day, but there was still five and a half hours of working time in the day, well, six and a half on our schedule. And that there's plenty of stuff to be done. Tanks have to be filled um, and checked. There have to be um, uh, objects have to be cataloged and cleaned. Toilets have to be scrubbed. Dishes have to be washed. All that stuff. But our the, our philosophy was that everybody does everything. Everybody gets a chance to dive and excavate, but that means everybody washes dishes and cleans toilets and records objects as well. And if I'm doing it as the project director, you can't complain to me that you're being treated unfairly. This is most of what the cargo was, with these uh, clay jars, which we were able to, later to determine were made in the Crimea, um, in an area that was inhabited by Byzantine Greeks in the ninth century. It was a place known for the production of low-quality wine. And in fact, the amphores themselves are pretty low-quality as well. Um, about a quarter of them were marked with their owners' names. Uh, and we have three people who seem to be the most prominent merchants involved in this cargo. Uh, a N G E and E P I S. A N probably is uh, an abbreviation for Anastasius. G E is a common Greek abbreviation for George, uh, which also means farmer. And uh, Epis or Episco is short for Episcopos, the bishop. And the church, in fact, was a major producer of wine in this period. The contents were red wine flavored with herbs and fish. I'm not kidding. Um, about. Uh, 60 of these amphoras still had their stoppers in place. Almost all the amphoras were full of mud, but in the bottom of the mud you found grape pips and other evidence of the seeds and stuff. 
the other herbs that were used and fish bones. Ground up fish bones. It was ground fish paste that was mixed into the wine. You can still get this kind of wine on the north coast of Turkey, if you like, in, in its acquired taste. <laughs> Um, most of these, uh, all these were full, almost all of these were full of mud. 60 of them still had their stoppers in place. 45 of those uh, had mud under the stoppers because it infiltrates past the, the, the pine bark. Uh, 15 of them only had liquid inside uh, that no mud had gotten in. But that was most, it was, those were mostly seawater. Two of them had red liquid inside them that was clearly not seawater. It was decomposed organic material. Yes, we did taste it. 874 was not a good year. <laughs> Most of this wine also had large numbers of grape pips. One of the imports had over 600 uh, grape seeds in it. So if you're the kind of person who likes pulp in your orange juice, this wine is for you. We also had the stuff that the people on board the ship uh, carried for their own use, such as these pitchers. Uh, for pouring whatever they were drinking, probably wine, since there was plenty of food. Their uh, cooking and eating ware. Um, it seems like every guy in the crew had his own little cooking pot which holds one portion of stew. And we actually had meal remains in one of these. Stew. Um, some finer ware. We found a matched set of three of these little goblets, which look like a miniature brandy snifter. Uh, and they were found with a mold blown uh, glass bottle. The glass in these is about the thickness of a light bulb. So very fine ware. Probably belonged to the captain or a merchant on board. And he probably would not, would not have used these on board. Where they were found suggests that they were packed, maybe being carried as a gift, or maybe to be used only on very special occasions. Normally you don't find this kind of glass ware used on board ships. We also found uh, some of the provisions. Uh, we had two amphores that were full of olives originally, which now were olive pits. Uh, you can see that in the top right. But the two on the left in this photograph uh, were sealed, stoppers and then with pitch. They were old pitchers that had been broken years ago. Uh, and so they were being used now to transport. And what they were transporting were grapes. You can see some of that spilled out in the bottom right. One of these, the steel was so good that the grapes were still grapes. Brown, plump, juicy, purple grapes. It looked no different than what you might buy in the supermarket about a week after they've put in your fridge. And then another main prize, the hull underneath the ship. Uh, this was one of the main reasons we excavated this particular vessel, because we don't know a lot about the development in shipbuilding, um, as well as the development in trade just in this period. That when the Muslims invaded the Mediterranean world in the middle of the seventh century, it essentially shut down international trade for about 200 years. And this ship is one of the first ones we know about after that international trade started to revive. So one of the things we were looking at was the structure of trade in the period. We also wanted to know about the structure of ships. And so you can see here some of the hull structure exposed. And this is how much of the hull we had left. Uh, pretty much all of the starboard side of the bottom, uh, which is enough to be able to reconstruct the building process. And we can see already from this, for example, that they were using mathematical methods to predict some of the basic dimensions of the hull. Uh, and the method they were using is one that later became commonly used in Italy and was imported to Northern Europe and is the background to the type of naval architecture that was pr practiced here until about 1850. <coughs> we even were able to reconstruct how the ship sank. Um, it was clear that, because uh, we, we knew the weather patterns here, and this is not a place a ship should have sank based on how the wind blows. We think what happened is that they got into trouble and lost the ability to steer the ship uh, when the wind was coming out of the northeast. And it was blowing into the cliff. They cast all their anchors except one. So we only found one anchor on the ship. Medieval ships in the Mediterranean normally carry a dozen anchors. So they cast all the anchors to try to stop. The channel bottom's too deep at about 60 meters. Um, and so they smashed into the cliff, stern first. And then they tried to lighten the ship to save it, which is a typical maneuver. And so they started chucking the cargo overboard. Uh, and we know that because once we lifted the ship, we actually found three or four amphores underneath the hull, where the ship had come down on top of its own cargo. And we could see that all the ones that were found scattered around were ones that had originally come from a consignment belonging to one merchant that had been in the top layer in the hold. 
We also found not a single personal possession. No coins, no jewelry, no toilet kits, none of the stuff that you normally find on these wrecks. It's clear that the crew managed to get off before the ship sank and to take their stuff with them. And they were probably, this is where they were trying to go, the small harbor of Salinia. Um, but, uh, and they may have made it, but the ship never did. Uh, here you can see the location again. And uh, the wind normally comes here from the west, because this is a very high mountainous ridge. And if the wind starts to back to the north, or veer to the north, it stays here from the west until it gets over about to there, and then it can blow through the gap, and it becomes an easterly wind that blows you down the channel. And normally what you do in that circumstance is you just turn and run down behind this island. And they were probably trying to get into the harbor on the normal westerly wind, which is no problem, and the wind shifted suddenly about right here. We've seen it do that. It takes about five minutes to go from a westerly to a northeasterly wind with no intermediate wind in between, and probably broke something, and to avoid being driven onto the cliff, they had to try to enter. So this is uh, an artist's reconstruction. Actually, in the first season, when we were building all that extra stuff because we were waiting for the permit, we had an artist in the crew, um, and she decided to do a painting. This is all done in automotive uh, touch-up enamel on the wall of the dig house. That should tell you a little bit about the kind of projects we do, the structure of our diving environment, which is, I would say, a kind of technical diving. It's one that's based around creating a very carefully thought out plan to accomplish the task, and then following that plan very carefully, using mixed gas on occasion. We don't typically work in overhead environments. Thank you very much. Find that any diver on the old room uh, dugout were any more susceptible than others to decompression sickness. You had seven confirmed and seven unconfirmed. We had seven confirmed and seven unconfirmed. Um, the age range of the participants makes it a little hard to come up with statistical da data there. Most of the participants were people in their 20s and early 30s. Um, one of the decompression, in, two of the decompression incidents were. Um, older men, as men over the age of 55, you know, over the age of 53, excuse me. Um, most of the rest were all people in their 20s and 30s, but that mirrors the distribution of people on the project pretty, pretty well, so it doesn't seem to be any bias. The one case that did involve permanent damage was the oldest participant in the project. Bruce? I'm looking at your numbers up there. You said you had like seven or eight cases out of 22,000 like hits. But then the other one was 8,000 cases and no hits. So all the hits on air and the others were on nice cars and no hits. Yeah, well, um, let me go back to the uh, <coughs> slides so you can see the numbers. Um, on the Ulubrun project, which was the deeper project, that's um, the upper end of the site at 45 meters. We have, that's where all the cases of decompression sickness occurred. We're all on that project. Seven confirmed, seven probable, but not confirmed, according to the, the hyperbaric position on the project being treated. Um, all the confirmed cases occurred, on, all these cases occurred breathing air, because that's the only thing that was used on the project. All the confirmed cases occurred before they shifted to in-water oxygen decompression. And it was believed that that was the single biggest factor in cutting down on the incidence of decompression sickness. And of the probable cases, most of those occurred before they went to in water oxygen decompression. Our project uh, that I led, which was at a shallower depth, the maximum depth we were diving was 36 meters. Um, we had no confirmed cases of decompression sickness, whether we were on air or on nitrox. The two chamber incidents. One occurred on air, and that was the one that later proved to be not diving related. The other one that was the middle ear um, imbalance, that occurred on nitrox. But we had one other incident of that middle ear uh, occur uh, two years previously on air, 
And the only thing that those two incidents had in common, aside from the death, was that they were the only two Danish participants in the project. <laughs> Did you report all these profiles to Dan, since you talked with Dick Van? Oh, sorry, sorry, Dick Van, I'm sorry. Lindley Van's an archaeologist. Sorry, uh, Dick Van. The, uh, we, in fact, were part of Dan's uh, project for collecting data about divers. And throughout the entire four years of the project, we had 10 divers every season who were wearing dive recorders, and we provided all that data to Dan. It's interesting. Uh, I assume that you guys didn't make any deep stops. It's a controversial subject for you know, diving on the edge of tech wreck. Uh, so I assume you didn't make any deep stops. Um, we had one table uh, that required a stop deeper than uh, 20 feet, six, 6 meters, and that was if you were on the longest table at 36 meters, you had to stop at 12. Okay. But that, but nothing below. But nothing like, uh, in this instance for, for tech rec on the edge, it would have been like 50 or 60 feet. Nothing at that range. Nothing at that range, but um, what might be related is that uh, on these tables, our ascent rate was to be kept uh, the normal, at, that, at that time, the normal rate being taught in sport diving was uh, an ascent rate of 60 feet per minute. Yes. And our ascent rate was limited to 30. Yeah. Okay. To, to cut the ascent rate in half, to yeah. slow the ascent. Boy, you know, uh, I know that Dan uh, right now is negotiating with the University of Wisconsin to do this kind of testing with deep stops, and it's going to cost them a couple of million dollars to do this at the University of Wisconsin. They could have used you guys as guinea pigs, for, you know, five years ago. Well, we'd have been happy to do it, um, and, and if they were willing to spend a few million, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I, I'd throw I, that I, I have trouble raising eighty-five thousand dollars a year to do this. You know, this would have been. Um, do you have any of this data recorded outside of uh, uh, computer downloads off of Vitex or whatever you used? Uh, we actually have it in quite a few different formats because we distribute it to the different people. Um, I'm sure it would be available if you wanted it. The person to contact is the fellow who is the dive master, a guy named Bill Charlton. And he was um, responsible for running the dam into the project. Okay. The, uh, the hits would be of interest against the background of everything else you've done, so thanks. And that data is available. Okay, I will uh, talk to you later. Maybe. Great. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, what you described was a sort of evolution in procedures, where you also make the step from regular air to using nitrox and O2 for decompression. I was just wondering if some of these procedures have found their way to other locations where underwater archaeologists are working on projects? Um, they have, they have because the, <coughs> the Institute of Nautical Archaeology has been perceived as a, an industry leader for a long time and so we have a lot of participants <coughs> from other institutions who come in, particularly as young people. And when they start running their own projects, they've taken away some of this diving practice with them as well as archaeological practice. Um, as uh, as we used to joke, you know, there's the right way, the wrong way, and the Ina way. And, uh, and that, that's us. Um, there is a little bit of hidebounness within the Institute. A lot of this, well, we didn't do it that way in Gelodonia in 1960, so why do we need to do it now? Um, but yeah, it has been evolutionary, and it has spread out through the people who participated in the projects. Um, the other large organization doing this kind of diving and training was a French organization called Cosme. Direction de la Cherche Activities du Marin, that uh, did similar long term projects off the coast of France. And their key people had started out working on these kinds of projects with INA or INA's predecessors in the 60s and adopted <coughs> similar sorts of, uh, of practices. But it's, it's mostly a Mediterranean thing because one of the things it depends on is you have to have a clear water environment. Um, you can't post you can't post an alternate air source three meters away in one meter visibility. And there's no point to that. Um, it, it depends on being able to see your way around. Who's, there's somebody else I hand up here. Nope. We're all, we're all done. Um, wait, wait, wait. Hello. Oh. <laughs> 
Did you have any prerequisite for dive level, I mean, dive experience or certification levels? Yes, that was something that actually that, that also evolved over the course of the project. Um, originally, the INA philosophy had been it's easier to teach a diver, to do, uh, an archaeologist to dive than it is to teach a diver to do archaeology. Um, and some parts of that, I would say, are, are still true. That um, the whole broad range of what doing archaeology is is not just excavation, it involves laboratory research, that sort of thing. Um, and so there was a tradition early on of willingness to take people who were complete novice divers, who had just passed their Open Water One certification and thrown down to 40 meters in this structured environment. And for the most part, it worked out OK um, in that nobody got hurt. But I think that was luck as much as the structure of the project. As uh, the institute developed, there was a, a greater and greater expectation of skill coming in. Uh, and so because in the United States we don't have as well developed a certification system for scientific or professional diving, we were mostly dealing with people who had sport diving certifications. Um, and especially in the 80s and 90s before a real the infrastructure developed to protect diving, for example, for adva and really advanced diving training, we were forced to rely on that. For this project that I ran, our minimum requirement to be considered as a diver on the project is you had to be at uh, Patty's Advanced Open Water with the rescue course under your belt. And I think we needed 25 open water dives beyond uh, your advanced certification before we would take you. And then once we got you, um, if you were a new diver, uh, we actually ran an on-site course for two weeks. Your first two weeks in the water, you had two instructors who were making sure that your diving skills were up to par, that your buoyancy control was up to par. Because that's really the most important thing on an archaeological site, is you have to be good at buoyancy control. You can't slam into the bottom uh, or float away. So. But that was our biggest problem with visitors, for example, is most of our visitors had terrible buoyancy control. They were people who donated money to the project, so we couldn't say no to taking them down there. But the normal way that I gave a tour to a visiting diver, which included a lot of so-called underwater journalists who wanted to do articles for their driving magazines, um, where somehow they hadn't learned to handle a camera and a VC at the same time, was I swam right above them with my hand clamped on the regulator bar. Just look at this. Look at this. <laughs> Don't touch that. Um, because we wanted, we wanted, we had a double uh, aim there. We wanted our divers to be safe divers that we could rely on. And if I get in trouble, I want to know that my buddy can save my ass. Um, and we also wanted to know that they had enough, they had the diving enough under control that they had enough brain left to think about the archaeology and if they could do a good job of the archaeology it wouldn't damage the site they could excavate and, and document properly and we found that uh, at the Ulubrin period when they were still taking novice divers that didn't work we needed to go with a higher basic competency level we were in our own um, ran our own dive courses back on shore in texas at texas a m that we organized um, the basic education with instructors that we knew would give a good course and, and would report to us whether these guys could dive or not. So we, we, we ended up having to get into the dive training business in a big way um, in order to assure basic competence for archaeological divers. And we, and we abandoned that. You, you, it's harder to teach a diver to do archaeology than it is to teach an archaeologist to, do, to dive, because you have to be equally proficient at both to be any good. Otherwise, we now have a coffee break for half an hour. And then we'll come back to hear our last presentation of the conference. And any announcements?